Hello, and welcome to Naba Perspectives, a new weekly series of podcasts and live streams by the Norwegian African Business Association, or Naba, where we look at key trends, themes, issues, and stories that are shaping the economic, political, and of course, business landscape across the continent. I'm Lanre Akinola, the head of content at Naba, and this week I want to talk about climate change in Africa and the upcoming COP28 UN Climate Conference taking place in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates from November 30th to December 12th. I want to focus on the overall narrative around Africa and climate change, why that narrative is flawed, steps that are being taken to change that narrative, and what that means for how Africa is positioned in the global fight against climate change. I'm also going to talk a bit about financing needs for Africa's green transition and the opportunities for investment that Africa's green transition presents. To start with, and to set the scene with a bit of context here, let's uh, let's have a, a quick discussion about the narrative when it comes to Africa in climate change. If you are at all familiar with the continent when it comes to the issue of climate change, you know that Africa contributes very little to global emissions. I'll get a statistic up on the screen here. In 2021, the whole continent contributed just 3.9% of global emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and industry. Over the last two decades, this has, this has fluctuated from just 3.4% to 3.9%. This is by far the lowest globally. So Africa has not meaningfully contributed to climate change, to, to say the least. However, at the same time, what we also know is that the continent is widely recognized to be the world's most vulnerable region to the effects and impacts of climate change. So here's a statistic from the African Development Bank, which estimates that the continent loses up to 15% of its GDP per capita annually because of climate change. So this dynamic of uh, a, a continent that contributes very little to to global emissions, which is symptomatic of the region being home to uh, many low-income countries, many countries that are on the so-called least developed country list, um, and, and a continent that is very vulnerable to the effects of climate change has given rise to this idea that uh, Africa is primarily a victim of climate change. It's a place that lacks the financing, it lacks the resources, it lacks the capacity to meaningfully do anything about climate change, let alone be a significant player on the global stage when it comes to tackling climate change. So Africa is seen not universally, but generally as primarily a victim. We can debate the merits of this perspective, but I think it can be argued that this is in a way kind of flawed, actually kind of, or maybe it's better to put it this way. It's quite counterintuitive because what we also know is that the continent is home to vast amounts of resources that are essential to key aspects of the global fight against climate change uh, and the global green transition, particularly when it comes to uh, things like energy, renewable energy. We know that Africa has vast potential renewable energy production, be it wind, be it solar, be it hydro, be it green hydrogen, or what have you. There's no shortage of potential across the continent. When we look at something, when we look at the area of critical minerals, so that's things like cobalt, things like lithium, manganese, uh, copper, minerals that are essential to the production of electric vehicles, of EV batteries, which of course, in the biggest scheme of things, are uh, are integral parts of the global climate change debate and the global climate action debate. Many of those resources are in Africa. The estimate is that 30% of all mineral reserves globally are on the continent. Many of those are critical minerals. Right? The continent also remains fairly underexplored. And there's very little data about actual reserves. And it's widely assumed that there's actually a lot more uh, a lot more on the continent. So we have this kind of paradox where a lot of what the world needs to tackle climate change and to drive the green transition is in Africa, yet somehow the continent is dismissed as not having any kind of meaningful role to, to, to play in this regard. 
Now, thankfully, this is changing. And um, a lot of this is due to efforts that are underway on the continent. And uh, to illustrate this, I want to have a, a look at an event that recently took place in Nairobi, Kenya. This is the Africa Climate Summit 2023. This is the first of its kind. It's the first time that African countries have come together for a major summit to discuss climate action and to coordinate around climate action. And um, this is significant in the sense that it represents not only growing awareness about the need for the continent to act on climate change, but it's also it also illustrates a greater or a growing coordination and collaboration among African countries uh, in terms of tackling the issue of climate change. Now, this conference brought together uh, leaders from across the continent. It brought together regional economic communities, UN agencies, representatives from the private sector, civil society organizations, indigenous peoples, and so on and so forth. Uh, that alone, so this being the first of its kind and having so many different actors from across the continent come together is in itself reflective of uh, growing, growing action on climate change on the continent. Now, what I want to focus on is the message. Uh, the message from, from the Africa Climate Summit. And this goes back to the topic of the narrative and changing the narrative. As we can see here, it quite clearly states, if you go onto the About Us page on the Africa Climate Summit website, Africa is ready to contribute to global decarbonization efforts by leveraging its abundant resources, including renewable energy, critical minerals, agricultural potential, and natural capital. Harnessing these assets, Africa can drive its own green growth and support global renewable energy needs. The continent also offers a range of investment opportunities for global capital to promote decarbonization and local economic development. So, in other words, Africa isn't just a victim of climate change. Africa is not only ready to contribute to global climate action, but has the res necessary resources to be a meaningful player in key areas like renewable energy. Now, apart from the, the, the message, which is kind of unequivocal, it's like the narrative on Africa needs to change, uh, there was also um, a declaration that came out of the Africa Climate Summit, the, Ni the so-called Nairobi Declaration. Uh, I'll just get that up on the screen here. There we go. Uh, so the the African Leaders Nairobi Declaration on Climate Change and Call to Action. And there's some interesting takeaways from this. Uh, some of the key points that were outlined in this was a proposal uh, for a global carbon tax to help fund green projects and a call to action for a new financing architecture that is responsive to Africa's needs including debt restructuring and relief. And uh, what we also have here is a note that the, the declaration will serve as a basis for Africa's common position in the global climate change process. So again here, what we see is uh, evidence of a continent that's coming together for the first time in a meaningful way to, uh, to tackle the issue of climate change head on, but also this appeal to, you know, to the international community to say, look, this is how Africa can be a, you know, a, a, a contributor and an, and an actor and an agent in driving global climate action. All sounds good. It's all great. Uh, these, are, these are undoubtedly positive signals and positive steps. Uh, a quick note of caution, though, on this and uh, on the declaration in particular. So, while it might be, you know, we could, while it might be desirable and even necessary uh, to implement things like a global, uh, a global carbon tax to help fund green projects and to reassess the nature or the structure of global finance, the global financing architecture, and make it more responsive to Africa's needs, uh, including debt restructuring and relief, we have to be a little bit realistic about the uh, odds of this happening. Uh, one, Africa at this point, as things stand at least, simply doesn't have the clout on the global stage to meaningfully pressure 
um, international actors in, in, in countries, particularly developed economies, which are going to be essential to implement these kinds of initiatives. Uh, and if at all, if, if, there, if there is even is a positive response to this call to action in the Nairobi Declaration, it will likely take a very long time for anything along these lines to be implemented. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the Loss and Damage Fund, uh, which was agreed upon at last year's COP, uh, COP27, which incidentally was in Africa. It was hosted by Egypt. Uh, and the, the major outcome from that was uh, the so-called Loss and Damage Fund, which is an initiative aimed at supporting particularly vulnerable countries in uh, mobilizing financing for countries that are particularly vulnerable to climate change and helping them to deal with unavoidable risks from climate change. Now, this has been hailed as a major milestone and a big breakthrough in terms of global climate action, and that may be the case. But the idea for a loss and damage fund was first floated back in the mid-1990s. So it's taken almost 30 years to get to the point where an agreement is in place and as we can see here uh, on this article by the Associated Press, the process is far from complete. It talks about tense negotiations at the final meeting on the loss and damage fund, which uh, ended in Abu Dhabi last weekend, and that, the, uh, that there's a draft proposal, which is now going to be presented to global leaders to sign at the COP28 climate conference. We'll see what happens with that, but the point is that even after almost 30 years, there's obviously still a lot of work to be done, and there's still not a strong consensus on how all of this is going to be implemented. So if uh, the Nairobi Declaration is to achieve some of these uh, ambitions, especially at the global level, it will likely take a long time. That is not to detract from what I think are the important takeaways from, uh, from the summit. As already stated, there's more urgency behind the need to, uh, to drive climate action on the continent. There's a greater sense of unity and collaboration. And if Africa can form a common position or take adopt a common position on, clim on the climate change process based on the Nairobi Declaration, that could make for a more influential voice going into not only this Cup, the upcoming cup in, in Dubai at the end of this month, but also going forward. So, so th that in itself is, is kind of an important development. And the underlying message here, going back to the narrative, is that Africa is not purely a victim of climate change. It has the potential to, to, to contribute meaningfully, uh, and it is ready to do so. It has the resources. Now, the Africa Climate Summit isn't the only thing that's going on. Uh, there are other initiatives out there. And uh, let's just have a very quick look at another one here. This is the Africa Carbon Markets Initiative. This was launched at COP27 last year. And uh, it has the ambition to mobilize $100 billion in financing through carbon markets by 2050 and to create 100 million jobs across the continent. But what unifies these initiatives is the is the, the the kind of the common message that we need to shift the discourse around Africa from victim to actor in terms of uh, in terms of climate change. So that's 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 one thing um, I wanted to talk about, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out at COP twenty eight uh, at the end of this month, whether we see uh, a stronger. Uh, more unified African voice, and to what extent that can actually meaningfully influence negotiations and the climate change process at COP28 and beyond. Uh, moving on, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the question of the opportunity, because one of the important things to come out of the uh, Africa Climate Summit, there's an article here by Bloomberg. Uh, oh, no, sorry. Uh, I've got a CNN article here that I'm just going to pull up on the screen. So one of the important things that came out of this is that um, a lot of money was pledged to invest in Africa's green transition, uh, including four and a half. So overall, 23 billion pledged and um, 
that includes four and a half billion pledged by the United Arab Emirates alone to uh, fund clean energy initiatives in Africa. And this brings me to the other, the other, the the other main topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is uh, financing, and financing needs in particular when it comes to Africa's green transition and climate action on the continent. Now, financing is one of the it's one of the key it's one of the key obstacles to harnessing the potential that africa has as i said earlier when it comes to things like renewable energy and critical minerals both of which are integral to the global climate change debate and global efforts to tackle climate change uh, there's no shortage of potential uh, on the continent the challenge is harnessing it and one of the biggest obstacles to that is financing First of all, let's get a sense of the opportunity. And then we'll, then we'll look at the financing in a little bit more depth. Um, here is a quote from the African Development Bank. This is from its annual African Economic Outlook, where it says that Africa's green transition offers the private sector trillion dollar investment opportunities in climate and green growth sectors, right? So trillions of dollars worth of potential uh, in principle, uh, that is that is probably true, uh, given the vast potential for renewable energy and the vast reserves that Africa has in, in areas such as critical minerals. In principle, uh, that makes sense. But in practice, we're a long way off of hitting, hitting those kinds of notes. And uh, here is... So have a quick look at this article by Bloomberg, which I think kind of captures, kind of captures the um, the crux of the issue. As COP twenty seven looms, Africa receives. So this is from a year ago, but these statistics haven't changed much. Uh, Climate policy initiative says annual needs are two hundred and seventy seven billion. And if we scroll down, actually, hang on, I've shared the shared the wrong. Share the wrong window there. Here we go. There's the article. And uh, here's the key paragraph. At 30 billion, annual climate finance flows in Africa are just 11% of the 277 billion needed, according to research published Wednesday by the Climate Policy Initiative. And this cuts to the heart of the matter. The reality is that as of today, Africa is generating and attracting a tiny fraction of the kind of financing that's needed to meaningfully harness the opportunity that exists in areas like renewable energy and critical minerals. And if we go back to the AFDB's uh, African Economic Outlook, we can break this down in a little bit more detail. Uh, where has it gone? Here we are. There we go. So when we look, when we go into the actual report, what we find is that, uh, yes, here, once again, the bank informs us that the private sector, it is in the private sector's best interest to invest in climate action and green growth sectors thanks to the enormous opportunities for high returns they offer. For example, there are climate investment opportunities of about 1 trillion through 2030 in energy efficient buildings, low carbon transport, and renewable energies in Africa. And investing 1.8 trillion between 2020 and 2030 in climate adaptation and resilience could generate private sector investors 7.1 trillion in net benefits globally. Very impressive figures. It kind of underlines the massive potential that uh, that exists for investment into in, into Africa's green transition. Uh, but if we scroll down a little bit further, what we find is that uh, we get a bit of a uh, reality check where the bank informs us that, however, private climate finance flows in Africa have fallen short of the continent's needs, which I think is putting it rather mildly. Between 2.6 trillion and 2.8 trillion 
is needed by 2030 to implement the continent's climate ambitions as expressed in nationally determined contributions. Put annually, this comes to 234.5 billion, to between 234.5 and and $250 billion. However, of the 29.5 billion in total climate finance flows in Africa in 2019 to 2020, private finance of 4.2 billion, tiny amount, on, was on average more than six times lower than public finances, the lowest proportion, proportion among the world's regions. Given the current level of private finance flows, Africa's pl private climate finance gap is thus estimated to reach about $213.4 billion a year. All right. So we can see there that we have a long way to go to, uh, to, to, to achieve or to, to harness the investment potential and the financing potential that is out there. And um, there's another statistic I, I want to look at here quickly. This is from the International Renewable Energy Agency. Here we go. And this is this is on renewable energy. So despite having huge amounts of potential for renewable energy production, according to IRENA, only 2% of global investments in renewable energy in the last two decades have gone to Africa with significant regional disparities. And less than 3% of global renewable jobs are on the continent. Again, it just kind of underlines the, uh, the, the gap that exists between potential and reality. Now, the shortcoming or the kind of absence in private financing is problematic in its own right, but I would say it's becoming more urgent and more problematic almost by the day. Um, many African economies are finding themselves in a bit of a fiscal squeeze. Actually, the IMF recently called it an acute an acute funding squeeze, I believe they called it, where you have a confluence of uh, rising debt and concerns about debt sustainability across the continent, um, which is hitting growth and reducing fiscal space, combined with rising interest rates globally that have that have that have really put the squeeze on the ability of governments to uh, to spend on not just on. Um, on, on, you know, um, to spend on the basics, on essentials, on critical infrastructure, on education, um, on any, any kind of public expenditure, including presumably uh, 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 funding for climate action. Right? So the need to mobilize private capital is uh, in many ways more urgent than it has ever been. So that begs the question, why do we have this apparent disconnect? Uh, why is there so much potential? but apparently so little appetite to in to invest on the continent. And here we can go back to the um, to the African Development Bank's African Economic Outlook, and um, we get a sense of what needs to be done, what needs to be done to address this. And it tells us that to unlock the potential, of this one of this trillion dollar market, several transformative policy actions can turn this potential into concrete investment opportunities and mobilize private sector financing for green growth in Africa. And it goes on to list a whole bunch of recommendations. I'm not going to read through all of them. There's quite a bit, but let's have a look at some of the highlights here. First, African countries should develop and cost long-term strategies to provide strong signals to domestic and international stakeholders on their green growth and climate change priorities, to translate these strategies into sectorial strategies, plans, and regulations. They also need to strengthen governance and accountability systems to ensure that the proceeds from private finance generate the expected and maximum impact for green growth. They should establish national standardized blended finance vehicles that offer attractive returns. Multilateral development banks and development finance institutions need to support African countries' efforts to address debt sustainability and create an enabling environment for climate investment. These institutions should lead global efforts to support African countries in 
creating a conducive environment for climate investment and in advancing their transition to a low carbon pathway. It goes on. Rating agencies need to expand their framework to better reflect the real potential for the African market. This could involve reforming rating procedures to ensure that risk or credit ratings include the true potential of the African green growth markets. Developed country governments, which make up uh, a majority of shareholders of multilateral development banks and development finance institutions, should champion discussions and actions that enable these institutions to reduce their aversion to risk. So, in other words, the steps that are necessary to translate the potential for investment and financing in Africa's green transition, by extension, the uh, ability to tackle climate change, and by extension, to reposition Africa uh, in, in the global fight against climate change, and to, to address this narrative of victimhood and move to a narrative where Africa is an actor, uh, potentially even a leader when it comes to global climate action. The, it, what, what, what this tells us is that the steps necessary to do this are nothing short of deep, structural, medium to long-term reforms, not just by African governments, but also involving uh, multilateral development banks and development finance institutions, involving global credit rating agencies and changing the way they do business, bringing in governments from developed countries to champion these initiatives and to drive discussion and action on this. Long story short, these are all very difficult things to implement, and they will, even under ideal circumstances, take a long time to implement. So, unfortunately, where we are today, as things stand, the disconnect between the potential and the financing that Africa needs, particularly the private capital that is going to be needed and, and needed to be ramped up quite significantly in the coming years to, to tackle uh, climate change on the continent and to position the continent as a, as a, as a global leader in the fight against climate change um, is, is likely to persist for quite some time. And uh, there are no guarantees that this is <clears throat> there are no guarantees that this is going to meaningfully change any time soon. Now, it's important not to be too discouraged by this. It's it's easy to despair when looking at these figures and getting an idea of uh, <clears throat> just how big the disconnect is. <clears throat> Some of these statistics are arguably a little bit behind the curve. And it's difficult to capture everything that's going on. But uh, the reality is that there is more investment going into areas like uh, the renewable energy sector. There is more investment going into critical minerals. And overall, there is a growing awareness and understanding and acceptance that investing in Africa um, and investing in Africa's green transition is, uh, is not only good business, but is also important in terms of the global fight against climate change. And there are a couple of things uh, that I just want to share here that illustrate this. So this, this is uh, a story about <clears throat> Chinese uh, battery maker Goshen High Tech planning to set up Africa's first giga battery factory in Morocco. Uh, and the company could invest up to six billion, six point three billion, in the country to set this up. Uh, this was announced back in June. There have been a couple of other announcements with invest uh, announcements of investments into the EV battery space uh, in Morocco since. They are also to the tunes of billions of dollars, and there are also initiatives underway in other mineral producing countries on the continent. To, to move up the value chain and to um, to capture more of the value chain in terms of critical minerals, to ramp up investment and to leverage this to drive economic development and drive uh, sustainable growth and development. So places like Zambia, places like Zimbabwe, places like the Democratic Republic of Congo, they're all taking steps to move up that value chain. Um, and... As noted earlier in that CNN article at the recent Africa Climate Summit, $23 billion was pledged to, um, to invest in sustainable development and, 
and presumably climate action and green projects on the continent, four and a half billion from uh, the United Arab, Arab Emirates alone. Uh, and these are just these are just some examples. You know, there are many more examples across the continent of this. So, you know, it, 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 these it might things might not be moving as fast as we want, uh, but it's important not to be too kind of cynical about this. Uh, there is there's a lot of foot. Um, there's some momentum, and I think when you combine that with what I discussed earlier, so you know, the continent coming together in a more meaningful way to coordinate around climate change, coordinate around climate action, um, is growing momentum uh, behind, you know, changing the narrative away from a continent that is a victim of climate change, a continent that needs aid, to a continent that is positioning itself as uh, a destination for investment, as a, a part of the world <clears> that has the potential to play a fundamentally important role in things like the renewable energy transition and uh, the development of uh, critical minerals and the you know the, the implications down the line of that value chain for the overall green transition you know it's the, it's none of this is impossible i think that's i think that's the key point here you know there's we can't sugarcoat it um it's 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 an uphill struggle no doubt and it will be difficult i think particularly at a time when a lot of african economies are under increased pressure fiscally and economically, and with the global economy going through, to put it mildly, um, a bit of a slump at the moment, it won't be easy, but it can be done. And we're seeing some evidence that things are happening. And all of that um, hopefully can translate into a situation where we're looking at Africa not as some sort of you know charity case um, when it comes to climate change, but a part of the world that is part of the solution. And who knows? could even be a leader in driving global climate action. Anyway, there's a lot more to be said about all of these topics. Uh, these are huge topics, and we will be discussing these in more depth in future programs. But for today, I think the key takeaways are this. Across Africa, uh, there's more collaboration. There's more urgency behind the need to drive climate action. There's um, growing momentum behind shifting the narrative away from being a victim towards being an actor in the global uh, fight against climate change and we're seeing and we're seeing more investment going into key sectors like renewable energy and the critical minerals value chain it'll be interesting to see how this plays out at the cop 28 summit at the end of the month whether the outcome of the well, or whether the the ambition of the nairobi declaration to adopt a common position is something that we're going to see in action and to what extent that is going to influence the discussions and negotiations that take place at COM28. Uh, you know, think of it as a bit of a test case for, for Africa and a bit of a temperature temperature check about where the continent is in its in its efforts to, you know, for lack of a better term, get its act together in terms of climate action and driving climate action. We shall see. It'll be an interesting uh, couple of weeks in Dubai to uh, to watch. Anyway, that's it for today. Uh, before, I, uh, before we wrap up, if you thought this video was interesting or uh, useful in any way, uh, consider liking the video, uh, consider subscribing to our channel. We're gonna be doing these uh, videos weekly, and we're going to be covering a lot of the important issues that are shaping the business and economy, uh, the, the economic and business landscape in Africa. Uh, we're going to have guests on um, where we're going to be hearing from experts about uh, some of the key trends and issues. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more, if you want to know more about NABA, if you're curious about what we do, uh, you can visit our website at Norwegian African. .no, where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Anyway, that's it from me for this week, uh, for today. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll be back next week.